The notorious SS general Reinhard Heydrich declared at the Wannsee Conference that Europe would be combed of Jews west to east. In point of fact, it happened the other way around, east to west. It started with the brutality of the Einsatzgruppen on the Russian front, but in time, the rounding up and deportation of Jews to the camps became Nazi policy in Western Europe as well as far west as France. How exactly did the Holocaust come to France? Let's take a look back at the Third French Republic, spanning the period from 1875 to 1940. Watershed event took place in the middle of those years, the notorious Dreyfus Affair, culminating in 1905. The ultimate acquittal of a Jewish French military officer, Captain Alfred Dreyfus, unjustly accused of treason, brought about a genuine separation of church and state as a new progressive attitude took hold in France. Suddenly, there arose opposition to Jesuit religious education in schools. The society became truly open to minorities. Jews served freely and openly in the military, even as generals. Jewish judges, politicians, and legislators became a genuine part of French culture. France in the 1930s even saw its first Jewish prime minister, the left-leaning Leon Blum, but make no mistake, the dark background noise of anti-Semitism was still around. The anti-Semitic journalist Edouard Drummond declared that France had become Judaized. Moreover, Jews challenged the very nature of the French state. Bear in mind, there were still dreadful memories of trench warfare on French soil and the notion of rebuilding the army was far removed from French priorities. Throughout the 1920s and 30s, the main idea was to avoid war. There must be no replay of World War I. The many cemeteries dotting the landscape reminded the French of the horrors that war can bring. Consequently, when the Nazi menace arose and the Second World War broke out, the attitude of the French was quite the opposite of England's defiance. Northern France was occupied in just a short period in 1940. The German Blitzkrieg amounted to shock and awe, and the new reality of occupation left the French reminiscing about the pre-war past. While Germany directly occupied the north of France, a separate German allied government was established in the town of Vichy and extending across the whole southern half of the country. For a good many French, it was infinitely preferable to live in Vichy, France, rather than under direct occupation. After all, the south of France with its magnificent Riviera had always been a place to vacation and convalesce. Consequently, a mass exodus to the south ensued, as up to 10 million of the country's 40 million people fled to Vichy. Historically, France was one country in Europe that had always been open to receiving refugees. And so they came. Over 3 million refugees, including Italians fleeing Mussolini, Spanish Republicans, and 200,000 Jews, mostly Eastern European, along with some from the Balkans. There were about 300,000 Jews already in France in 1933, but now that number ballooned. 
At the Von Zee conference, it was calculated that there were 165,000 Jews in occupied France and a staggering 700,000 in unoccupied territory, that is Vichy, France. The head of the new collaborationist government in Vichy was the aged Marshal Philippe Pétain, considered a hero of World War I. But now his role was to seek compromise with the Nazi administration. On June 17, 1940, Pétain addressed his people on the radio and temporarily at least assuaged their fears. Frenchmen, having been called upon by the President of the Republic, I today assume the leadership of the government of France. Certain of the affection of our admirable army that has fought with a heroism worthy of its long military traditions against an enemy that is superior in number and in weapons. Certain that by its magnificent resistance, it fulfilled its duties to its allies. Certain of the support of veterans that I am proud to have commanded, I give to France the gift of my person in order to alleviate her suffering. In these painful hours, my thoughts go out to the unfortunate refugees who in an extreme penury are furrowing our roads. I express to them my compassion and my concern. It is with a heavy heart that I say to you today that the fighting must stop. I spoke last night with the enemy and asked him if he is ready to seek with us soldier to soldier after the honorable fight the means to put an end to the hostilities. May all Frenchmen rally to the government over which I preside during this difficult ordeal and calm their anxieties so that they can better listen only to the faith they have in the destiny of the fatherland. In short order, Pétain was given a new charge by his Nazi overlords. Deal with the exodus from north to south. So the old war hero called on his people to return to direct German occupation in the north. Return to yourself, he declared. He addressed his people as follows. Immense tasks face France. One has only to stop and think of the refugees and the supply problem to estimate their gravity and scope. The nation's communications must be restored. Each man must be returned to his house and his job. In these dark days, after France has been forced to the ground militarily, new trials have been inflicted upon her. We have a most difficult task to accomplish, for which I need your confidence. I have formed a new government composed of 12 ministers who will be assisted by general secretaries taken from the principal services of the state. Governors will be in charge of the 12 large provinces. Power will thus find itself centralized and decentralized simultaneously. Officials will not be subjected to too much supervision. They will be free to operate and quicker to have more responsibility for their acts. In order to regulate certain questions in a better manner, the government is preparing a seat for itself in the occupied territories. For that reason, 
We have requested that Versailles and the ministerial quarters in Paris be vacated for us. We must apply ourselves to create an elite corps without any other consideration than their capacity to command. Labor is France's supreme resource. International capitalism and socialism exploited and degraded France. Both participated in preliminaries of the war. We must create a new order in which we no longer admit them. We shall renounce neither profit, which is a powerful inducement, nor saving. Gains will remain as recompense for both labor and investment. Your work will be defended. Your families will have the respect and protection of the nation. We must recreate lost confidence. The French family will remain the depository for France's long and honorable history. We know that youth must live and draw its strength from the open air, which will prepare it for life's battles. We must see to that. Let us give ourselves to France. She has always led her people to greatness. It's been said that Pétain was basically in a dance with the old values of the French Revolution, liberty, equality, fraternity. In Vichy France, all would be redefined. There would be a new triad of values and a new official motto, fatherland, family, and work. Keep the Nazis happy and maybe they'll leave us alone. Nonetheless, for Hitler, France had always been a sword in the back, stemming from Germany's great humiliation at the Treaty of Versailles. He was reluctant to enter a full coalition with France. Instead, the French must simply accept the terms of the armistice, allowing Germany peace of mind. And speaking of work, French labor would be used. By the hundreds of thousands, the French would be conscripted to work for Germany. Still, among the French, there was no real opposition to Pétain. The overall attitude was, wait and see what will happen next. And there were, of course, other French leaders who stood defiantly against the Nazi occupation. Charles de Gaulle, is a prime example, as he left France for Britain, joining forces with Churchill. But oddly, the French people did not rally to his side, seeing his actions as those of a maverick. The common sentiment was, ni Pétain, ni de Gaulle. Not Pétain and not de Gaulle. It's important to point out that while the Vichy leadership was conservative, it wasn't fascist. Still, for Pétain and the Vichy leaders, it was easy to blame the war and all of France's troubles on the Third French Republic and on Léon Blum. And that certainly smacks of anti-Semitism. On October 3rd, 1940, Jews in France were now defined even more broadly than the criteria of the Nuremberg Laws as people who had at least two, not three, Jewish grandparents. French Jews were incredulous. They saw themselves on an equal footing with the rest of the French population. They were leaders in French society. Many had even prevented Eastern European Jews from entering into the organizational structure of French Jewry. What's the scholarly issue here? Recall that in Hungary, 
No outside pressure from the Nazis was required to bring the issuance of anti-Semitic laws. It was all a Hungarian initiative. But in this case, we can say that no French government under Marshal Pétain would have passed such laws. This had to be German pressure. And things were about to get worse. On March 20th, 1941, the Commissariat for Jewish Questions was created to oversee the implementation of the new anti-Semitic policies. The question for Jews was, when must we admit that the Third Republic is gone forever? It's time to disentangle from the past and recognize the present. Perhaps we can find common ground. After all, the values of Vichy, fatherland, family, work are also Jewish values. And let's remember that the Jews share the social values of France. So it was that the chief rabbi of France spoke openly of rapprochement with Vichy. The response of the Jews of France was the same as the response of the French in general. Wait and see. In time came the Aryanization of the French economy, which must be cleansed of Jewish economic power. Still, there were no ghettos in France. The yellow star was not required to be worn until June 1942. Consequently, the Jews of Vichy found themselves living in a twilight zone. The first deportation of Jews from France began in March 1942. But almost all were Eastern European Jews. Native-born French Jews were not affected. But in July 1942, the Jews of Paris began to be rounded up for deportation. In August 1942, Vichy was targeted. The government of Vichy, always collaborating with Germany, allowed Jews to be assembled in camps in the south of France. The question was whether the French citizenry would assist in the roundups. Some Jews were in fact offered to the Germans by the French, but the number was still far below the 50,000 that the Nazis demanded. We can make a generalization here that through all of the shifting values of those days, a new period of negotiation between church and state was opened up in France, one not seen since the Dreyfus Affair. Vichy's line was, we must collaborate with Germany in order to cleanse French society. But this did not go down so well. Previously, there had been an equilibrium of sorts between state and society. But now, French clergy largely silent since the Dreyfus case, when it came to politics at least, took the lead in opposition to the state. The admonition that went out was this, don't grant Pétain any legitimacy in dealing with the Jewish question. There was no barrage of pastoral letters. There didn't need to be. There was instead a moral message communicated directly from pulpit to parishioners. What resulted was a trickle-down effect. The time of wait and see was over. There would be a firm break with Vichy. By the summer of 1942, the resistance to the government was legitimized. It had become a Christian duty. About 80,000 Jews were deported from France in the end. Nothing to brag about, but far fewer than the hundreds of thousands of Jews who lived there. The majority of French Jews found escape. In over 6,000 towns all across France, individual French gave significant aid and shelter to their Jewish neighbors. As Professor Yehuda Bauer additionally noted, organized Jewish groups also saved 
thousands of lives by falsifying documents. With the help of friends, institutions, and individuals, various Jewish groups were able to hide up to 7,000 children. Many French Catholic prelates and all Protestant pastors actively opposed the Vichyite and Nazi Jewish policies and hid Jews or supported rescue actions along with a large and growing part of the French population. As a result, about two-thirds of French Jewry was saved. Apart from organized Jewish groups, many individual Jews participated in general French resistance groups. In the final analysis, it was all about making a statement on a personal level. And that made all the difference.